Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about macroprudential policy and financial stability, uh, generic versus uh, sector-specific rules. It's a joint work with Taban Mudis, who is also sitting here. And uh, of course, uh, this, this piece of work is in the context of South African economy. If you think about it, um, this is basically the outline of my uh, today's presentation. I will first give you some, some background of the topic and, uh, and then some empirical evidence, show you some data, and uh, then briefly talk about the objective of the, st of, the t of the study and then go through the model and show you the main findings. Okay. So both policymakers and academics has realized that uh, uh, any uncertainties in the financial sector can have a very severe impact on the real economy. This lesson learned from the recent 2007 and 8 financial crisis and also the Great Recession we experienced after that. And there's also a general consensus that uh, regulating financial sector should move towards macro prudential approach instead of uh, regulating individual banks or uh, name bank financial institutes. Then, what are we going to talk about the so-called macro prudential policy is related to uh, the loan to value ratio. There are also other uh, instruments such as capital asset ratio and the liquidity coverage ratio and reserve requirement ratio. Where today we talk about basically Say if you walk into a bank, ask for bank loans. So banks evaluate, let's say you want to buy a house worth one million. Then the bank say, okay, we can only lend you 700 solvent. 
So in that sense, your LTV, loan to value ratio, would be 70%. That's what we refer to. Um, in the past, we normally have a constant uh, LTV ratio applied to those borrowers. After the crisis, uh, financial sector started realizing, you know, a rule-based uh, LTV uh, policy might be more appropriate. By counter-cyclical, we mean, see, for instance, uh, output sometimes increase, sometimes decrease. It's kind of like a fluctuation. So if any other uh, variables, see consumers' consumption, also moving in the same direction as op output, we, we, we see consumption is pro-cyclical. If it's counter-cyclical, we mean, you know, when output increase, private consumption actually decreases. That's what we mean, counter-cyclical. So in that sense, counter-cyclical LTV ratio means during the economic boom, you know, credit growth increase, and then, then you need to tighten this <coughs> LTV ratio. And on the other hand, when the economy is going down and the risk materialized, then you want to relax your LTV ratio. All right. The logic behind this is actually quite simple. When economics is going up, credit growth will, will grow faster and, and higher, then you don't want to, you don't want the potential crisis to occur, then that's why you need to tighten this LTV ratio. In other sense, I will only lend you see 50% of the loans if your house is worth a million, right? So, now, what are the challenges with this so-called counter-cyclical LTV policy? First would be the design. So, when it comes to the design of this kind of policy, in the past, we always have a, have a you know, unique LTV ratio applied to different type of borrowers, no matter your households or your firm. And also is a constant. Now, what if you know the behavior of the credit from households and firms are different? So in that sense, you need to focus on different type of borrowers. That is the reason why we want to look into this topic. When it comes to implementation, so when you implement this kind of so-called sector-specific uh, uh, LTV ratio, so these policy parameters by how much you need to increase or decrease this LTV ratio in response to see the changes in credit or the changes in output. So how are you going to implement this? Do you react to aggregate credit or you react to spe sector specific credit? See household mortgage loans or you know firm corporate loans. That's the challenges that we have with, with this kind of policy. So, if, if we plot the data, uh, here you will have uh, uh, corporate loans. That, that's, those are the firms that borrowed by, uh, sorry, these are the loans borrowed by firms. And uh, here you have household uh, loans. Let's refer to mortgage loans or bond. If you can see, after the Asian crisis, there's a severe decline in, in household loans, and then followed a very good period from uh, the end of 2001, and then up to just before the crisis, 2007 and 8. Then there's a, a decline after the crisis, when the bubble burst, and it continued to the end of uh, 2016, where the data we have available by the time we work on this, this paper. Whereas for corporate loans, you can see uh, it's rather quite flat after the Asian crisis, and then catch up the, 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 the good period of growth, then start declining after the crisis and became flat again, then recovered since 2013. You see the difference here and here, right? So also prior to 97, 98 Asian currency crisis. So that's just to show you these two different type of credits, they actually behave differently. They move differently, right? 
So it's a macrofinance topic, so you would also want to uh, plot these uh, um, key macro variables and with these financial variables. All I want to show you is overall you can see, as I just explained to you, uh, all these housing prices and private consumption, they move in a procyclical way with output. See, in other words, if output increase, you will see housing prices also increase in most of the time over the sample period. Except this, this, this period, which is a question worth looking into it, as you can see. So if GDP is, is procyclical, sorry, if housing price is procyclical, move uh, in the same direction with output or GDP, you should see you know, uh, this consumption also move in the same direction with GDP as well, right? And also these mortgage loans, household credits. This just gives you an idea how this, this housing price or the value of your property can actually affect the, the fluctuation of, of the credit market and also the real economy. When we talk about real economy, we refer to GDP or output. So now, what exactly we are doing basically is we propose a so-called uh, sector-specific uh, LTV uh, policy rule. In which sense, you have two regimes. The first regime would be this, this M you can regard as that LTV ratio, all right? So when you adjust this ratio, you adjust it according to the change in total aggregate credit. That would be the sum of uh, household credit and firm credit, okay? And in, in this sector-specific rule, then you, what you will have is you will have, uh, you will adjust this, LTV ratio in response to change in household credit or corporate credit instead of aggregate here. Whereas you also look at the changes in output. So if output changes, you also adjust your LTV ratio accordingly. These are the policy parameters that are referred to. You need to give a proper value to adjust this uh, this LTV ratio corresponding to any change in output and any change in either aggregate credit or in the sector specific credit. That's what we proposed. So other than that, we basically compare the effectiveness of these two regimes and see how they enhance financial and macro stability. And when it comes to the measurement of, of financial stability, we look at the volatility of credit and house price. Volatility refers to, you know, uh, in statistics, we call it variance. And uh, in this context, we call it the volatility, where you can think of, you know, the fluctuation, you know, extreme case, you know, of, of this, this uh, house price and, and also credit. Macro stability, obviously, we look at output or GDP. And then we try to answer the question whether the regulatory authority should implement a generic or sector-specific uh, LTV uh, re regime. So how are we going to address this, 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 this question? We, we develop a, a so-called real business cycle uh, general equilibrium model. Right. It's economics and management science. We refer it as a social science, but it's still science. So you need a little bit of uh, mathematics and uh, statistics to be scientific so that you can sell your research. So why is it must be a dynamic and stochastic general equilibrium model in the sense that uh, we have to believe we do not live in a static uh, life, right? So life is dynamic. Stochastic stands for uncertainty, you know, shocks. So you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Things like what happened in the past, you can think of what, September 11 in the States. You can also think of the reshuffle of the cabinet uh, by firing nine ministers and deputy ministers, you know, just the 
you know, less than an hour before the first of April, you know, things like that. So these are all the all the so-called stochastics, uncertainties and shocks. So why it has to be a general equilibrium? You and I are households, so we consume the final production, consum consumption goods and service. At the same time, we also provide labor to firms to produce these, these final goods and service, right? And also, if government, make, government makes any policy announcement, it will affect everybody. We as households and also firms, and also, of course, the financial sector. So we interact each other within this, this general equilibrium model. You can't see I'm living in my own world. Whatever happens elsewhere does not affect me at all. So that is why uh, this kind of dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model becomes one of the two mainstream of macro modeling approach. So what we do is, we, we, of course, we need to incorporate a so-called macroprudential policy into the model. That is what I briefly uh, introduced to you just now. Then we calibrate the model using the South African data, right? So those uncertainties that we are looking to be the productivity shock, that means if there's any improvement in the technology, obviously the economy will grow faster and there will be positive impact. We also look at a loan loss shock. That means the borrowers, both for borrow, households, borrowers, and, and also entrepreneurs or firms, they might be default, all right? If they don't repay the loans, then what are the consequences on the credit market and also the real economy? And then finally, uh, we look at housing demand shock for a reason I will explain to you uh, in a minute, all right? So, then we conduct a number of analyses, which I'm going to go into details in the end of my today's lecture. So um, just to give you a very brief picture of this kind of a model. So in this economy, so you have borrowers and savers, all right? Where savers, you, you put your money in the bank as a deposit, you are savers, you provide the liability to banks. So what banks do is basically bank intermediate between savers and borrowers. So banks will use your deposits and then lend credit to, to the borrowers. Who are the borrowers? The borrowers will be the firms and the household borrowers as well. So you also work, you supply labor to firms to produce the final goals as I just mentioned. And also you, you purchase or you, 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 know, you rent house, you know, so you can think of you have budget now, right? You have salary income, then you consume, you spend money on consumption, on housing, you know. Of course, you need to pay tax. And uh, borrowed households, on the other hand, you know, you, you, you don't save. Uh, see, you, you, in your 20s or 30s, you buy a house, you, you apply for a bond, you get mortgage loans, you are the borrowers, one type of borrowers. So you go to the bank, Bank will assign an LTV ratio to you, telling you, okay, I'm not quite sure if you honor the, the loans, so I can only give you 50% of the loan, you know, or 30%. If you, you have a decent job, you might get a higher LTV ratio. I'm not quite sure on that. So when you go to the bank, you have to have some collateral, right? So no, most likely banks will see, okay, uh, your house will be under my name, not your name, until you fully pay the loans. So that collateral will be your house, and that's why whole house price matters for this credit market and real economy. For firms, most of the firms borrow, either issue bonds or borrow loans from banks. But in this case, we only consider bank loans, we don't consider bonds. So firms, Likewise, you use your so-called commercial property. You go to the bank and then apply for loans. Use your commercial property as a collateral as well. So what banks does already exp explained to you, you just take the money from the saver and then give it to, to, the, to the borrower. And then you charge a higher rate to make money. Okay, that's how it works. And then the regular authority would be simply conduct the so-called uh, counter-cyclical activity ratio. Now, if you think about why we look at the loan loss shock and the housing demand shock, 
see there's a positive housing demand shock, housing, housing price increase. It will affect both types of borrowers, right? Both households and firms, because they both use their housing as a collateral to borrow. But if you look at the low loss shock, if only households default certain fraction of their, the loans they borrow, it will only affect household credit market. This will not affect uh, the firm's credit market, corporate credit market. So in that sense, there is a motivation for the regulatory authorities to implement this so-called sector-specific regulation instead of a generic one. That's the argument, and that's the certain point we want to, we want to saw in this study. So these uncertainties I've already explained to you, and, uh, and on the other hand, if you think about the housing demand shock actually is from the demand side, and where loan loss shock is, can be regarded from the supply side, because firms apply for loans to finance their production. Okay. So you also see the demand supply story in economics 101. So um, after the preamble of the model, I just give you a short, uh, screenshot of the model. So basically, as I said, to be scientific, you need to have some mass and stats. So in this whole model, we basically have 32 equations with 32 variables. So we need to solve the model, find the equilibrium, and do the simulation. Okay. So what is next would be we, we need to get the data from, from various source and to calibrate the model to the South African economy. Why we need to do that is because it, it makes your study or your findings applicable to a specific economy, right? So. Before you do any analysis, you want to look at how good your model uh, performs in terms of uh, reproduce the second movements of, of the data from the data. So that is why we look at the standard deviations, which is the, with, uh, the, some statistics here. I mean, uh, it's uh, the square of standard deviations gives you the variance, which is the volatility I referred to. Okay, so. You can think of the extremely volatile case in the fluctuation of a particular uh, variable. So the good thing is we, we are able to, the model is able to reproduce uh, most of the case uh, we observe from the data. As you can see, house price and deposits and household loans and corporate loans, they are all more volatile than output, uh, whereas the lending rates are not. My drawback would be the consumption. In the data, you see consumption is always more volatile than output, but the model fails to produce this, this property. And the correlation, as I show you the figures, you've already seen you know, consumption in house prices and deposits, and also those loans are positively correlated with output. In other words, they move in the same direction, okay? whereas the lending rates moving the opposite direction. So given the number of shocks we consider also is a real business cycle model, which I'm not gonna go into details about this kind of model. So we, we view this model performs fairly well in terms of reproducing what you observe from the data. So we can carry on with our analysis to, to, to do those kind of uh, investigation to answer the question. So, as, as I mentioned from the beginning, you know, the authorities' objective obviously focus on macro and financial stability. So what we find is when it comes to the question of which one is optimal, and in academic sense, obviously, you need to look at the welfare, and which I'm not going to go into that direction. The funny enough is, is that it's not a, you don't get a unique answer. Actually, the answer is really shock dependent. In other words, if you look at the technology shock, which I explained to you just now, and the financial shocks, which is the loan loss shock, you will see actually the sector specific uh, regime outperforms the general one. And then when you look at uh, uh, 
um, this housing demand shock, you will have a general re re generic regime or to form performs the sector specific. The same applies to the size of the policy parameters that I show in the first two equations. I'm not going to go into details on that. Okay. So in short, you will see, you will realize actually the answer is really shock dependent. It all depends on the origin of the, the uncertainty. Where does this uncertainty come from and how they affect uh, the credit market and the real economy? Obviously, now you can think of they actually through this collateral constraint or the borrowing constraint, right? The, the market value of, of your, your, your house matters for the amount of loans you can get. So that's exactly why I said, you know, when it's a financial loan loss shock, you know, why is the sector specific regime is preferable? It's simply because it's related to a specific credit market. When when housing market boom occurs, then they affect both credit markets. Right. An extension from this, you, you would want to think of that uh, not only this this credit market, also the property market. If you think about the last three four years, the housing market in, in the Western Cap, we had a very uh, a good period of recovery. And whereas this is not the case in the northern part of the country. So for the regulatory authority, if you want to change your policy, you should consider that regional difference as well. So the same logic applies to geographically, right? So um, then the dynamics we mean, we compare uh, the baseline case where, uh, where we have a constant LTV ratio, as I explained to you, and uh, and uh, we have this optimal generic regime and optimal uh, sector specific regime. So we find the good thing is that our finding is quite positive that both generic and sector specific regimes are effective in you know, achieving the two objectives of, of the macro potential policy. And the channel would be the boring constraint channel, as I explained to you. And once again, you know, the, this effectiveness of, of each regime is actually shock dependent. Okay. Now, um, if I can show you one figure from our, our analysis that is, 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 is feasible to interpret would be the, this one. So what is the, efficient, the efficiency policy frontier tells you is the following. So here you have the volatility of credit market, okay? So basically you can think of the fluctuation of the credit market. And on X, uh, X you will see the same for output or GDP. So as a macro potential regulatory authority, you would want to stay in this corner, meaning you have less volatility for both, for both output and the credit, all right. This black dot stands for baseline would be the constant LTV policy regime. So as what we had in the past, you implement a fixed constant rate and to everybody, okay? You can see it's far from this, this corner. And whereas this sector specific LTV regime, you can see outperforms generic one, and also the, the baseline regime, which is quite good. It's a favorable result to us. And the second finding here you can interpret is that there's always a trade-off between financial stability and the macroeconomic stability. You can't have the both at the same time. So I believe in decision-making in your personal life is always a trade-off. When it comes policy, it will be the same. If we want to have a, if we want to have, you see, uh, let's see, moving from here to here, you have less volatility in credit market. In other words, your financial stability is improved. But then at the same time, your macro stability getting worse. That's what the slope of these two lines tells us. 
Now, finally, would be when it, when it comes to implementing the, this kind of uh, policy regimes, what we find is basically the, the stabilizing effect on financial stability actually diminish, diminish if the regulate, regulator responds aggressively to change in credit. So that's the policy parameters I refer to. <coughs> if you imply a very big number of these policy parameters, it's not going to do anything good for your financial stability. Response to change in output can achieve financial stability only if the regulator responds moderately to change in financial variables. These are the detailed recommendations to policymakers. Okay. And however, regardless of whether the regulator, regulatory authority responds to change in output aggressively or not, aggressive response to change in credit does not contribute to macroeconomic stability. Okay. Whereas a moderate response to change in credit has a significant impact. Okay. That's based on all these kind of, uh, I think, four or five analyses that would be basically the, the main findings that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you to Huang Ming for this, this lecture. Um, he works in a very technical field, um, but I think he was very good tonight and, 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 and not focusing on the technical aspects, but making it, even for us that don't work with the technical work, to make it uh, understandable. So thank you very much for that. For that. Um, also, um, another word of thanks for everybody that was involved in, in, in organizing this, this, this function, the lecture, and the refreshments you're after. Um, and I want to, at this point, also invite you, uh, everybody, to, to join us for the refreshments. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's great to welcome you as full professor in the department. Um, as you've already heard, you joined us in 2009 after a review of our postgraduate macroeconomic offering resulted in us identifying a lack of expertise in dynamic macroeconomic modeling. Um, by that time, Wang Ling had completed his PhD at the University of Pretoria on specifically a topic on dynamic stochastic general equilibrium modeling, and which was suitably qualified to address this need. He was given the task to develop and teach a core module on dynamic macroeconomic modeling in our master's program and to act as supervisor for students interested in this field. Um, his expertise was soon recognized by the South African Reserve Bank and it was also, yet also mentioned by, by the Dean. He was appointed as research fellow at uh, the Reserve Bank's Financial Stability Department, where he applies his modeling expertise to financial stability issues, um, a very topical issue after the global financial crisis, when we experience financial instability on a global scale. And this lecture of his is an example of his contribution on this topic, uh, where, amongst others, uh, important policy issues uh, for the South African Reserve Bank were highlighted. Gongling, it's my pleasure to welcome you as full professor in economics, and we look forward to your contribution in teaching and research in the years to come. Thanks. Thank